Hey, thank you for joining us at Revolution Church, where we are starting a revolution of grace in one life at a time. Hey, if you ever have any questions, would like to support this ministry financially, or you just want to learn a little bit more about us, you can head over to our website at revyourlife.com. And be sure to give us a follow on Facebook and Instagram. And you know, we would love for you to stay connected throughout your week, wherever you may go, with our Rev app. That's free and available for you to download wherever you might download your apps. And we hope that you enjoy today's message. Amen. Well, welcome to 2020 at Revolution Church. I'm excited that you're here. Stay on your feet for a second. We want to greet everybody watching online and our God Behind Bars guys in the prison. Would you make some noise for them? We love you guys. Also, our armed forces, servicemen and women all over the globe joining us. We love you. Thank you for your sacrifice. We honor you. Make some noise for our military families. And no matter where you are, remember we're one church with a mission. Would you say it with me? Our mission is starting a revolution of grace in one life at a time. Well, like I said, welcome to 2020. I don't know if it's been good for you already, but there's a lot of year left. So regardless of how much cedar your year is starting with, come on, anybody feeling the cedar right now? Oh my, look at the, oh my gosh, so many sniffles and... So much snorting and grunting in church. I love it. Feel free to cough, okay? Grab your notes, and we're going to jump right in. Um, it's kind of an appropriate title since everybody's kind of snorting and spitting and coughing. I'm calling today Stuck in the Spit. Everybody say, Stuck in the Spit. Stuck in the Cedar Spit. We are, man, we are stuck in the spit right now. I'm going to take you to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. God says to you and to I, behold, I am. Everybody say, he is. he is. There's no question about it. He is. I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Not later. Not next year. Right now. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. My goal is... Uh, through the month of January, is to help you perceive the new thing God wants to do in your life, the thing that is actually already springing forth, to help you figure out the answer to the question, could it be that you're stuck in the spit in life? Because see, God has a vision for every single believer, and, and our vision here at Revolution Church for you as an individual Christ follower is the same vision that God has. We, we want you to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Right? Following Jesus is about these different movements in life. It's about this beautiful biblical ecosystem, this thing that's just constantly happening in us, but also through us. We want to help you know God. If, if you don't know God when you show up, our prayer is that you would give your life to Jesus Christ. And if you already know God when you show up, we want to help you know God better than you ever have before. We don't stop there. We want to help you find freedom. Come on, every one of us has something we could find freedom from in life, right? We're all people in process. The way I know that is you're still here. If you're still here, God still has some work to do in your life. And so we find freedom in our groups together. We've got Celebrate Recovery, Financial Peace University, and tons of different small groups. We do small groups in our student ministry on Wednesday nights for our teenagers. Uh, your children down in Rev Kids will experience a small group environment before they leave today. Because there's just some things you can't do in this giant room with all these people sitting in rows staring at a guy with a microphone. Sometimes you got to sit in circles and look at each other in a smaller environment and do life together. We don't want to leave you there. We want to help you discover your purpose. And so every month we do a round of what we call Grow Track. It's three simple steps to help you uh, figure out what church membership is all about and if this is the church you want to join. Uh, it helps you figure out the spiritual gifting God has put inside of you and the personality, the way God's made you, so that you can connect to God's kingdom appropriately and take the last step, make a difference in this world. But it doesn't stop there. As soon as we make a difference by going out and helping more people know God, man, there's always more freedom to find, more purpose to discover. God is the God of more. He's the God of more. But I got to ask you, are you experiencing the more he has for you, or have you maybe been stuck in the spit. Here's where I get the title, Mark chapter 8. And I want to go through this kind of slow. I don't want you to miss any detail here because it's so rich, the story of this miracle. It says, when they arrived at Bethsaida, everybody say Bethsaida. Bethsaida. Bethsaida, 
was a town Jesus and his disciples had arrived in. They're ministering there, or they're trying to minister there. It says some people brought a blind man to Jesus. Aren't you glad for the people in your life that will bring you closer to Jesus when you're spiritually blind, when you're just being a spiritual dummy, and you need someone to call it out, and you need someone to push you to your full potential? I love those people. And they begged him to touch the man and heal him. Jesus took the blind man by the hand, more on that in a second, and he led him out of the village. Then... Spitting on the man's eyes. Y'all, Jesus has lost his mind here, right? Like, Jesus has some cedar action going on too. So he's like, here's how we'll do this miracle. (laughs) Right? Like, right on the guy's eyes. He laid his hands on him and he asked, bro, can you see anything now? The man looked around. Yes, he said. I see people. At least I think they're people. I can't see them very clearly. They look like trees walking around. Then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again, and his eyes were opened with perfect 20-20 vision. See what I did there? All right. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything clearly. Jesus sent him away saying, don't go back into the village on your way home. How many of you are like me, and at the start of a a new year, you'll kind of reevaluate your life? You'll think through some goals, and not very many of you. Hey, I can help everybody else. I will take some time at the the brand new start of a year to, my wife and I will look at our budget, we'll say, uh, how are we going to give this year, how are we going to spend, how are we going to save, how are we going to vacation, you know, I'll look at my physical health, my spiritual health, my emotional health, I'll look at my productivity, I like to look at that one, I'm I'm a guy that likes to get stuff done, And, and so this year I'm doing something new, and the whole idea is that you never touch anything in life twice, so when you pick it up, you're going to take care of it right then and right there. Like kind of when you get a bill in the mail and you open it and you look at it and you're like, ah, and you could totally pay it right then in about 15 seconds, but what do you do? We'll put it in the pile with all the other ones and we'll deal with it later, right? Well, now you've spent way more time than you have to because you don't touch it again for a week, right? And isn't it funny? You can remember, I got to pay that bill. I got to pay that bill. I got to pay that bill. Every single day of the week, except the day you sit down at the desk where the bill is, you're like, I was supposed to be doing something and you can't remember, right? So then you leave and, oh, it hits you again in the most horrible time when you're not anywhere close to pay the bill. And and so before you know it, because you didn't take care of that thing, the very first time you touched it, you've touched it five, six, seven times, and it's taken 45 minutes of your life and three weeks of your your brain power and focus, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Well, clearly Jesus didn't get that productivity hack because he's touching this guy twice to heal him. Clearly, Jesus didn't realize, oh, he totally could have just healed the guy the first time. Like, I look at this miracle, and and sometimes you start thinking, did Jesus mess up here? Like, what is going on? Did Jesus have a bad day, right? Did did Jesus uh, say, bro, I'm so sorry, I didn't sleep good last night. Let me touch again. Did did Jesus say, I'm sorry, man, I'm dealing with a lot. I got Peter, he's always cutting people's ears off. I I got the Pharisees, those guys always be tripping. I got to deal with them over here. And and come here, let me just put my, my hands on your eyes again. What's going on? Like, did did Jesus mess up this miracle? This is a powerful miracle, by the way. Um, It's the only time in the entire Bible we have this miracle recorded, which is kind of different because most of the miracles we see, they're recorded more than once through the different Gospels. But this one, we only get it in Mark chapter 8. Not only that, but this is the only miracle where Jesus had to do it twice for it to work. Every other time, he did it one time, and it worked the first time. I think there's something special God wants us to see in this miracle. What's happening here? Did Jesus mess it up? But maybe, maybe the better question is, what's not happening here? Because I promise you this, probably none of you think Jesus messed it up, right? None of you think Jesus needed a, a mulligan on the miracle, right? I think we know Jesus is Lord. He doesn't mess up. Jesus doesn't go, oops, sorry. I'll get it right this time. I think he messed up the miracle on purpose, I think there was something he was trying to teach you and me and, and the disciples. And so to understand the miracle, let's, let's back up. Let's look at what's surrounding the miracle. Let's look at the context. You can go read the whole chapter, Mark chapter 8, and even a little before that and after that later, but, but I'll kind of give it to you quickly. Um, for a long time, Jesus has been trying to get the disciples to see that, that they're kind of spiritually blind in some areas, that they're kind of seeing things blurry in life. 
Not only that, he's also duking it out with the Pharisees day after day, trying to get these guys to see, you're so spiritually blind, you're completely missing the point. Also right before this, Jesus did this crazy miracle, you probably believe it, where, where this little boy brings Jesus his, his snack pack, his Long John Silver's number two, right? He's got some loaves of bread and some fish. Do you all remember that? And Jesus feeds 5,000, only it's not 5,000, they only counted the men, so it's probably more like fifteen or 20,000, with just this tiny amount of of bread and fish. Right after the 5,000 miracle, he does another one that's kind of similar that gets overlooked all the time. He feeds 4,000. And sometimes we overlook that one because we're like, oh, 4,000, that's not a big deal. Right before that, he fed 5,000. And we got to be careful with that because we're called to be faithful with everything God puts in our hand. Little, middle, lotl, small, big, giant, tiny, no matter what it is, we're just called to be faithful. Thank you, God. So we got to be very careful. The the miracle of the 4,000 could be the most dangerous miracle because we could overlook it. Just like we can overlook little things God's doing in our lives. After the miracles, it's funny, the disciples get on a boat and they bring one loaf of bread. There's 12 of them. One loaf of bread, which we understand loaf of bread. Like you start thinking, uh, you know, Mrs. Baird's, it's this big. No, loaf of bread is more like a little barley cake. It was this tiny little thing. They bring one of those for 12 guys on the boat. And Jesus is like, man, I got these guys on a boat. This is a great time to teach them something. And so he starts trying to teach them something. They misunderstand what Jesus is doing. Go read the story. It's funny. They think Jesus is mad that they only brought one little cake to feed all 12 of them, which is ludicrous, that he would be mad about that right after he fed thousands and thousands of people with just a tiny bit of bread. He's like, guys, do you not remember the baskets of leftovers that you just picked up? That was like, yesterday and you already forgot I took care of that I can take care of you as well and then did you catch the part where it says Jesus took the man the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the village of Bethsaida what was that about well we know if you if you continue to read that in Bethsaida there was no faith and and where there's no faith God will not do miracles so he had to remove the guy from the place of no faith over to a place where there was faith so he could work in the man's life God will do that for you He'll grab you by the hand right where you are if you're willing, if you will come to him in full surrender. He'll take you by the hand away from the thing holding you back to a brand new place where something new is springing forth. It's just your job to perceive the new thing that's already springing forth. It's just your job to allow Jesus to to take you by the hand and, and lead you to the new thing. What is Jesus teaching us? What is Jesus teaching the disciples by messing up the miracle on purpose? I think he's saying, hey, it is possible to be at a place where you're not quite blind, but you also can't quite see. Stuck in the spit. Frozen between phases of a miracle. Receiving some from God, but not the fullness that God wants to give you. And I wonder, could that be you? God touched you at one point in your life, right? He radically rescued you. He saved you. And that's pretty dang good. That's pretty awesome. But that's not all. And maybe you've been stuck right there for years, for months, whatever, wondering, man, is is Jesus mad at me? Misinterpreting the thing that that he's trying to teach you. Wondering, man, I, I thought there would be more. I thought I would experience more than this. So that's a dangerous place to be. And think about the guy for a second. Okay, so Even if he only got the first touch, that still would have been a miracle, right? Before, he couldn't see anything. It's just darkness. Now, after the first touch, he's he's seeing colors. He's seeing shapes. I don't know how it all works in your body. I'm not a doctor, but I know that, like, uh, the, the light enters your cornea, and then your brain flips it in real time or something crazy like that, right? And you can see things. He's He's seeing for the first time ever, just not very clearly. It's still a miracle, but it's not all of the miracle, And maybe that's you. It's still a miracle, but it's not all of the miracle. Like, it's a good miracle. You were dead. Now you're alive in Christ. But you've been missing out on the more that God has for you. You, You've stopped asking God to help you see more. You've given up on the idea that there's something new that's springing forth, that he is doing a new thing right now. And since you've given up, man, you, you can't even perceive it. You're not quite blind, but you can't quite see. Partially spiritually developed. I fear that many Christians are are frozen in that place right now. And the Bible talks about us growing up. Look at Hebrews 6. Let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let's go on instead and become what? Everybody say it. 
mature. Let's become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and, and placing our faith in God. And, and then look at it in the message translation. And, and you may not know, but we don't know 100% for sure who wrote the book of Hebrews because it doesn't say. But most scholars agree it was probably Paul. And I think without a doubt it was the Apostle Paul because that dude could be sassy as all get out, right? And look at this. This sounds like Paul. So come on, let's leave the preschool finger painting exercises on Christ and get on with the grand work of art. Grow up. Everybody say, grow up. Grow up in Christ. Could you be stuck in the spit, staring and staring at the, the obvious and the tiny little details? Look at 2 Corinthians. You stare and stare at the obvious, but you can't see the forest for the trees. The, there's little things you get, but God has so much more. You, you're seeing the trees, but they kind of look blurry, and you're, and you're missing the bigger picture, the forest. You're missing the bigger thing that, that God has for you, something new, something new that's, that's springing forth. Do you not perceive it? See, I've been praying that for some of you, 2020 would be the year you finally get unstuck spiritually, that you get out of the spit, that you, you move on, that you grow up to some, some grander things, because I'm telling you, we get stuck in the spit. And listen, even the spit in this story is so full of meaning. If you study rabbinical literature of Jesus' day, you'll learn that people thought there was medicinal purposes in the spit of their rabbi. They thought that the spit of the rabbi could heal them. Aren't you glad we don't do church like that anymore? <laughs> Pastor, my hip hurts. I put my spit up on your hip. When I dip, you dip, we dip. <laughs> You're healed. That'd be weird, right? Pastor, it's the cedar. <laughs> You're better, bro. Go, right? Like, that's just, I'm glad we don't do it that way anymore. But I think the purpose of the spit is that Jesus was, was using the spit, the thing that these people thought could heal them, to teach them about what could actually heal them. To teach them, no, you, <laughs> you're stuck in the spit. You're stuck with part of it. You're, you're not walking in the, in the fullness. Uh, what, what is the spit? The spit is when you're saved and you've got some perception, and you've been introduced to God, and you're kind of trucking through life. And those aren't bad things. Those are great things, but it's not all of the things. This is not all God has for us. There's so much more. We're not just saved. We're on a mission with him. We're not just saved to get out of hell. We're saved for something, to grow God's kingdom. We're saved to, to be people that start a revolution of grace in one life at a time. We're not only given perception uh, of the world whenever we're saved. We're giving a whole new perspective, an entire new outlook on life, a, a new vantage point, right? right? A, a heavenly mind, a heavenly way of thinking. It's not just perception, it's perspective. We're not just introduced to God, this is the best one. We are literally put back into a relationship with God. We're made right with God, our Father. There, there was a cosmic chasm between us and God. We could never be made right with Him, but because of Jesus, man, we're not just saved, we're in relationship with God. I'm telling you, some people miss that. They're saved, they're introduced, but they, they don't have a relationship with God. It's like the extent of their relationship with God is, well, I go to church every week. Hey, if you go to church every week and you think that's the extent of what God wants us to do in this life, you are so stuck in the spit. You see the trees, but not the forest. It's not about checking off an attendance box. It's about what God literally wants to do in your soul, in your life. It's about you being activated for God's kingdom. It's about the mission, and, and we're not just trucking through life. Oh, here's another week at church. I'm going to walk into church because that's why they're going to sing three songs, and then the pastor's going to say, let's make some noise for Jesus. Where? And then we're going to say the mission together, and he's going to say hi to the people online, and I'm going to sit in the fourth row, second seat from the right, because that's my chair. And No, we don't just truck through life. We experience the fullness of God's grace, right? God's hope, God's mercy, God's, God's joy, and I'm telling you, there's this great danger getting stuck in the spit. There's danger because when you get frozen, it's easy to look at someone who's experiencing more than you and get really skeptical of it. I don't know about those people in the front row. They're like crazy Jesus nuts. I don't ever want to take it that far. And so you just judge something you see rather than learning from something you see, rather than challenge, being challenged by something you see that could actually grow you, Right? Man, that pastor gets way too fired up about what he's reading out of that Bible. And you judge it instead of 
instead of learning from it. Or, or how about this one? You, you come to a place where you're complacent and you're just content and, and you think, well, this must be all there is stuck in the spit. Or maybe you come to a place where you create a spiritual facade. You pretend like you can see what someone else sees. Oh, yeah, I see it. Not, right? Oh, yeah, I totally see it. That's what the Pharisees did. They masqueraded, right? They, they pretended like they could, they could see, right? Or you'll be jealous. You were created to pursue God more and more every day, more of his goodness, more of his grace, more of his mercy. And think about how Jesus taught us to pray in the book of Matthew. Do you all remember this? He said, give us this day our daily bread. Do you remember that part of the prayer? If it's our daily bread, doesn't that mean there's new bread tomorrow? Every single day, there's some new bread in life. He's doing something new. It's, it's springing forth, but we have to perceive it to receive it into our life. He desires to do something new. He wants to restore our sight. Look at our miracle again in the message translation. So, so Jesus laid his hands on the, on the man's eyes again. This is the second touch. The man looked hard. It, it wasn't easy. He had to take a hard look. It didn't instantly hit him. He had to take a hard look at his life, and, and he realized that he had recovered perfect sight. He saw everything in bright 2020 focus. I think Jesus held back on purpose to teach us something to change us, right, to, to challenge us. He totally could have healed the guy with one touch because that's how he did every single other miracle in the Bible. But I think this one stands out and calls us to live by faith, not by sight. Calls us to trust him no matter where we are in life. How then, let's, talk, let's get practical for a second. Let's look at the blind guy's life. Let's look at, at his heart, okay? How do we actually get that 2020 vision? How do we perceive the new things God wants to spring forth? First thought, we've got to get genuine with Jesus. I'm talking about getting honest with him. There's something that changes in your heart when you get brutally honest, brutally genuine with Jesus. This guy, he's struggling, he can't see. He's sort of healed, and then he gets really honest with Jesus. That was probably hard, right? When you've heard there's this guy named Jesus, he does miracles, he heals people one touch. He just heals people, and then he comes, he gives you one touch, and you're not totally healed. Like, it would have been easy to go, thanks, Jesus, I'm good. Like, I picture Jesus going, how is it, bro? Do you like it? And the guy could have said, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's great. But instead, he's honest with Jesus. And he says, I reckon you got more. Jesus, I reckon you got more. I reckon you could probably help me see perfectly. To be honest with you, Jesus, stuff's still kind of blurry. And, and I wonder what's kind of blurry in your life. Like, I wonder what it is holding you back that you need to just say it to Jesus. Because healing starts when we say it. What do you need to get honest with him about it? Were you looking at porn last night? Is it alcoholism? Are, are you addicted to drugs? Is it gossip? Is it overeating? Is it same-sex attraction? Is it, are, you, are you hypercritical of people? What, what is it holding you back from wholeheartedly following Jesus? It, it's kind of like when you get a really bad gift at Christmas and you got to pretend like it's great. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all just did that, right? We were on the opposite end of that this year. We gave a gift to someone else, a family member, and they clearly did not like it, and they did a horrible job of acting like it was great. We gave it to them, and they opened it, and they didn't even say anything. They went like this. They just did the blank look. I was like, do you like it? And they're just like, so I'm thinking, well, maybe I don't know what to, they're supposed to use it for. So I explain it, and then she goes, okay. That's what this guy could have done, right? Do you like it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I like it. But instead, he was honest with Jesus. He is willing to admit that he thought there was more to experience. You will never experience the more God has for you until you admit that you have more to experience. Until you're honest with God. And you say, there must be more, God. And I've been praying for you that God would waken something deep in your heart, deep in your soul to, to come before him and, and to say, I reckon you got more. I'm talking about, number two, getting gritty with Jesus. Everybody say, getting gritty with it. Getting gritty with Jesus. Having some spiritual grit, some boldness before God's throne. Where you say, God, I want and need 
more of you desperately. Instead of falling into this false belief I see sometimes where, where Christians are like, oh no, I'm just supposed to be okay and quiet and content with everything. That's not what I see in our heroes of faith. I see Jacob wrestle with God all night long saying, even if you got to break my hip, you're going to give me my blessing. I've prayed that for some of you, 2020 will be the year that you wrestle things out with God and you boldly ask him, even if he has to break you down first, to teach you, to bless you, to change you, and to use you. The year of spiritual grit, where you ask, seek, and knock for every single thing God has for you. Ephesians 1 says, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we're in Christ Jesus. Not some spiritual blessings, every single spiritual blessing. And then Matthew 7, Jesus himself said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be opened. Ask, seek, knock. Have some grit. Ask, seek, knock knock like never before. And I don't want to just preach this one to you. I believe it's so key for your next year and even your next decade that I want us to do something together. There's a a flyer that you were handed. Will you get it? It says seven days of prayer and fasting. And so starting Monday, January 13th, that's not tomorrow, it's the next Monday because I wanted you to have a heads up. We're going to do seven days of prayer and fasting together. Now, before you, before you th- hear the word fasting and you're like, I don't know what that is. I think it's like you can't eat for seven days, and I'm definitely not doing that one, Pastor. Um, there's def- different ways of fasting in the Bible. And, and so I put the four different kinds of fast that we see on the back of this sheet. And I don't care how you fast. I just want you to join us in this journey. Ultimately, it's not about, not about the logistics of your fast. It, it's about you spending extra time with God to ask and seek and knock. It's about you wrestling something down to the ground that's been on your heart. It's about you getting out of the spit. So for seven days, we're going to fast and pray together. And a few things to help you get through it. First, take your phone out. Y'all put that back on the screen. I want you to text the word fast to the number on the screen. It's going to put you in a little um, group text. And listen, I know that group texts are an abomination to the Lord. So this isn't the kind of group text you're thinking where your phone's going to go off a million times. It's a system that we use where I can send you some encouragement during those seven days of prayer and fasting. And I can also notify you at about 9.30 a.m. each day, we're going to go live on Facebook and Instagram just for a few minutes to give you sort of a, a word of encouragement, a spiritual word of wisdom related to our fast each day. And then when the fast is done, we're, we won't bother you on that texting anymore, okay? So just a few texts. It's to help you. It's to encourage you. Sign up for that and read the sheet. Uh, read the scriptures on there. Learn about the different kinds of fasting. Prayerfully consider and choose the one that you think is right for you. And then seven days, we're going to pray and we're going to fast together to seek the Lord, to ask, seek, and knock like never before. Because t- I'm telling you, God has more for you. If you feel stuck, there is more Reminds me of the story of the professional golfer. He was the best golfer in all the United States, and he got invited by the king of Saudi Arabia to come over and play golf. And so he asks his friends, he's like, I got invited by this Saudi king to come play golf. Is it safe? And they said, yeah, we've done it. You need to go. It's awesome. And so he says yes, and this private jet picks him up, and he has this amazing experience, plays several rounds of golf with this Saudi Arabian king. And at the end of their golfing experience, the, the king says, Did you have fun? And he's like, yeah, I had such a great time. And he's like, well, the king says, I want to give you a gift. What do you want? And the golfer says, oh, no, you you don't need to give me a gift. Like, this was a gift. You paid for everything. I got to see different places and play golf, which is my favorite thing. And the private jet, bro, it's been amazing. And the king says, you insult the king? Because in our culture, I give you a gift. And and the golfer's like, no, no, I'm I'm not insulting the king. Um, How about you just get me a golf club? I like those. He says, well, let it be done. So the guy gets on the jet. He goes back home, and he starts to kind of get excited about this golf club. He's thinking, like, what is it going to be, like a a solid gold putter? Or is it going to be like a a three-wood with diamonds inlaid on the handle or something? He starts to get really excited. And a couple weeks after he gets home, FedEx shows up. But they don't bring a big package. It's an envelope. And he thinks, this is weird. And he opens it, and it's the deed to a 500-acre golf club in California. I collect golf clubs, okay? So, and the point of that story is that, church, we we don't serve a king. We serve the king of kings. 
who has everything, I mean, Ephesians 3.20, right? More than you could ask, imagine, or dream. I'm telling you, if you feel stuck in the spit, God has more for you. Let, let's pound on heaven's door together for seven days and ask and seek and knock. Jesus, what is it you have for me? That will take, thought three, it'll take some guts. Let's get some guts with Jesus in 2020. It takes guts to follow Jesus. If you don't feel like it takes guts to follow Jesus, I'd say you might not be following Jesus. You might want to relook at it, right? It takes guts to follow Jesus. It, it takes guts to do life God's way. It takes guts to agree that what this Bible says is true because sometimes we don't agree. It takes guts to come to a place where you trust that what he says is good and holy and purposeful and right and life-giving. Every one of us has some area where we think we know better than God and we try to go our own way. It, it takes guts to trust God. It, it takes guts to do for someone else what someone did for you. Someone gave so we could meet in this building. It takes guts to sacrifice and give to our building project so people can meet in a new building and give their life to Jesus. It takes guts to follow Jesus. It, it takes guts to sacrifice. It takes guts to trust God. It, it takes guts to discover your purpose. And the last one is we're gonna get giving for Jesus. I'm not talking about your pocketbook only. I'm talking about your entire life. You realize when Jesus said he is Lord, he wants to be Lord of all of our life, not some of our life. Amen? He's not the God of some. He's the God of all. So, so it's real simple. What does God want? All of it. I'm telling you, there's an element of sacrifice to following Jesus. It, it takes sacrifice to experience the second touch. It takes sacrifice to experience the fullness of his miracle. It, it takes an understanding. I am here on this earth to make a difference, not to take up space, not to have this meistic mentality. And, and think about the miracle with me. You probably didn't catch it because we didn't read it. That, we just read it one time. But, but what's the most mentioned thing in the miracle? It's the hands of Jesus. It talks about his hands more than anything else. The same hands that later were nailed to a cross as a sacrifice so we could have eternal life, so we could be on mission. His blood was spilled for the redemption of our sins. His blood was spilled to make us right with God. It was always about sacrifice. It was always about getting this man to a place where, where he could live to make a difference. Sacrifice should always be followed by sacrifice. The sacrifice of Jesus that brought salvation should be followed by us sacrificing and turning around so more people can give their lives to Jesus, so more people can be saved, so heaven can be built one life at a time. And so here's what I want for you and for us as a church. Remember the guy, okay? So first touch, hey, Jesus, it's still kind of blurry. Jesus says, I imagine, hey, I'm so glad you had the grit and the guts, man. I'm so glad you were honest because now I can give you what I wanted to give you all along. And he puts his hands on the man's eyes, it says, and then the man can see with perfect 2020 vision. My question for you, what's the first thing you think the man ever saw? It was the face of Jesus. Because Jesus moves his hands off the man's eyes, the first thing the man sees is the king. Some of you are seeking something. And you're never going to find the thing that you're seeking until you focus on seeing your king. The way we find what we're seeking, the way we get out of the spit, it's by seeing the king more clearly than we ever have before. Some of us need to get out of the spit. We've been stuck. We don't see the king clearly. So we're just continually seeking. I believe if you will seek the king like never before in 2020, you will find what you're seeking like never before. Because listen, you are not an earthly being having a spiritual experience. You are a spiritual being having an earthly experience. This world is not your home. It's temporary. It's not what you were built for. It's never what God intended for you. Yet we have a mission 
yet we have time here, yet we're in process. We, we are seeking God. What are we seeking him for? We're seeking him to work in our lives. We're seeking him to save our friends and family members. We're, we're seeking him to move in our church. We're seeking him to move in our country, in the lives of our teenagers. We're seeking him to move in the prison, and we're seeking him to move all across the globe in our church plants. We're seeking God to do the miraculous. We're seeking God for all kinds of second touches where things are blurry in life and we desperately need to see clearly. So would you bow your head and close your eyes? God, we never want to stay stuck in the spit. God, we just want to seek you. We want to see you more clearly than we ever have. Come on, if that's your prayer today, just lift your hand. God, I want to see you better than I've ever seen you. I want to know you better than I've ever known you. I want to see you move in new ways. God, I want to see new daily bread. I want to receive it. Help me to perceive it. You're doing a new thing, Father. I believe it. It's springing forth. It's already there. Help me to perceive it. Help me to see it. God, I pray for every person with their hand lifted because a lifted hand represents a lifted heart. We lift our hearts and souls to you and we trust you, Heavenly Father. Teach us and change us and make us brand new. You can put your hands down and as you continue to pray, there's somebody in the room every single service that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Like the the very first thing that we desire for you is that you would know God. And people give all kinds of reasons that they wait to take that step of faith. I've heard them all. Like, I gotta get my life right. Oh, I, you know, I, I had a guy tell me one time, I've got this tattoo that's just horrible. I gotta get it covered up. Then I can give my life to Jesus, right? People describe that they think they have to believe correctly every single perfect theological thing, exactly perfect, or, or they have to behave a certain way. Jesus never did it that way. He said, you don't have to, to believe a certain way or, or behave a certain way. You can belong no matter who you are. If you will simply come and take a step of faith. It starts with us saying, I want to belong. And the behavior and the belief follows that. We get it backwards so often. We try to behave first. We try to believe right first. Jesus says, no, just come with a simple step of faith. I'm telling you, if you were simply willing to take a step of faith that only you can initiate, you could come into a place where you know God and now God could begin the process of finishing all the miracles of giving you the second touch, of getting you out of the spit, but it starts with a step. Only you can take the step. We wanna help you take that step. If you're ready, it's a simple prayer we're gonna pray to mark your miracle moment. Let's all pray it together so no one stands alone. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Jesus is King. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Savior. I repent from my sin. I turn to you, God. Make me brand new. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give it up for the people taking that step today and for what God's doing in our lives.